See the field of fragile state indices and the rankings of Nigeria, we have been coming back precipitously from 54, number 54 in 2005, now to number 13. We are one of the countries under the red alert list. And so it hasn't worked. This, the concoction hasn't worked. The 36 structure, state structure that we have today, Ofodile argues very forcefully that this current 36 structure is contrary to the instruments of surrender of Biafra, that there are three conditions that they agreed on the instruments of surrender, one of which was that the Biafran, <laughs> Biafrans accepted, said, we accept the current structure, which then was a 12-state uh, structure, and that B or C of it was that any future change must bring all Nigerians on the table to agree. And that these were the things they signed at the instrument of surrender, but that the military unilaterally subsequently changed the structure without then the participation of the other side. And he argues that this is against the instrument of the surrender and that no wonder the South East has been marginalized out of it, five states out of the others having six and seven, as the case may be. Now, there is the issue of unitary fiscal federalism instead of the 1963 Republican Constitution on fiscal federalism. There is the expansive exclusive list and having over powerful Abuja. The development process is a trickle down from Abuja to the rest instead of a bottom up economic um, and development arrangement. The census and revenue allocation that disadvantages the Southeast, there is the citizenship question. The Igbos think they become visitors everywhere all over the uh, country. When it is time for census, the Southeast complain that they are about the only ethnic group that have maybe a majority of their people living outside of their homeland. And that during census, their populations are counted in the states where they live. Imagine a state, I mean, and then Population becomes basis for sharing the oil money in Abuja. When it is time for that, you count them in there, you don't ask for state of origin in the census. But then, you use also the population to get the allocations. But when it is time to share anything else, you remind them that they don't belong here, as the case may be. So there have been issues about citizenship uh, question, and so on and so forth. So, in other words, this system, it's not just the Southeast or the Igbos that complain. It has not worked for Nigeria. And my thesis is that even if any government, including this one, just appoint, have all the political appointments from the one village, my thesis is that the life of the average person in that village will not change. Just rewind it. Rewind it again. And think the other way. The last regime, we had an Ebele Azikiwe as president. We had secretary to government. We had minister of finance and uh, coordinating minister on the economy. We had all of this deputy senate president, this, that, and so on and so forth. Almost all, most of the financial institutions headed by people from the southeast. And yet, there is no motorable federal highway in Igbo land. This thing is an elite game, as far as I'm concerned. The issue of who and whatever and so on and so forth is not taking us anywhere. And unless we get to the heart of it. So, it seems that there is a consensus today. There is a consensus. If you take it much broadly, the North, I mean, so called North, if you calculate the number of years they were in power, but essentially, poverty is still predominantly a northern phenomenon. So, you know, that you control this and a few billionaires are made here and there and so on and so forth means absolutely nothing. The ordinary man in Nigeria is, has not benefited, is getting worse off by the current system that we have. But there is a consensus now on restructuring. And in that case, uh, Fordila would argue that Biafra becomes a metaphor. A metaphor for agitation by oppressed people, 
for justice, equity, and fairness. It hasn't worked for anybody. If you look at President Buhari recently said he also supports amendment of the Constitution or devolution. If you read the APC manifesto, it says, quote, as a change agent, APC intends to cleanse our closet to haul the dangerous drift of Nigeria to a failed state with a conscious plan for post-oil economy in Nigeria. To achieve this laudable program, APC government shall restructure the country, devolve power to the units with the best practices of federalism, and eliminate unintended paralysis of the center. End of quote. This is the government in power that controls 23 states. This is the APC manifesto. So, and the Southern People's Assembly talk about the same thing. The Afeni Ferre's position on the National Conference, if you read it, talks about the same thing. The National Conference report talks, supported by PDP, the same thing. So what is holding us? I must say the goal of this bit should be political stability and economic prosperity. In my view, a competitive federalism. We can write a book on this aspect of competitive federalism. Compared to the First Republic, when everybody had theirs, they had the resources, they, especially on revenue, a fiscal federalism. We've argued before, give everybody, leave everybody their own thing, let them pay taxes to the center. This umbilical cord where Abuja will set wage for everybody all over the country, and so on and so forth. It was for a time when all your money paid for it. Not anymore. Even in the US, you may have read about the governor of Maine, that the wife of the governor had to take a job in a restaurant to augment their income. Because given the state of Maine, the salary of the governor was not enough for, their, for them to survive on. And the wife had to take a job in a restaurant. The governor of Maine salary cannot be the same as the mayor of New York, and so on and so forth. But here we've done all of this, Abuja controls it. Anyway, um, that's for another day. But what is holding us now, what I call as matter arising, is that the detail, devil is in the details. Let the debate begin. What exactly do we mean by restructuring? The National Conference Report, for example, is a beginning. But in my view, it doesn't go much. It talks about creating more states, which misses the point. It's still more of the same. We are saying the ones that you have are not viable. Twenty-something states today cannot pay salaries. So what are we talking about? Or should we go back to the EQMS Constitution, the proposal of six zonal structure as the federating units? What model of federation? Should we use the UAE, United Arab Emirates system, or which one? are we going? Let us get to work and begin to think. Some people propose, and I agree, that we need a new constitution negotiated by the people of Nigeria. And my thesis is that if this is the only achievement of President Buhari, he would have been the greatest statesman ever in the mold of Abraham Lincoln. But we need to get this done that the people of Nigeria will have to get together and negotiate a new constitution for themselves. Second, or the third point, is leadership failure in Igbo land. It raises fundamental questions if you read uh, Chude's book on the, the, the collapse of failure of uh, leadership in Igbo land and the search for the new one. Uh, whatever. It's in that light it agitates your mind when we talk about the Igbo presidency. What does that actually mean? Is it to have one, somebody wearing a red cap in the villa, or what? If all that we say, even within the states, a governor is first his village, his local government, then his senatorial zone, so that he can be a chelozwa of his um, own um, local government or his village, and so on and so forth, then let the others care. Is that the kind of leadership we are talking about, about Nigeria, or in, in the new Biafra, as it were? And um, we have seen it, like I said, about people occupying offices and so on and so forth, and still nothing. So the question is, 
the same contradictions in Nigeria are also there within Igbo land. We cry of marginalization at the larger Nigeria, but there is also cries of marginalization within. There is the identity question within. There is the citizenship and indigenship question within. How many other Igbos live in Aba and in Abia, for example? But, I don't know, two years or three years ago, that was the indigenship thing, that all non-Abia citizens were sacked from the, the... But these people had lived there, worked there, paid their taxes there, they, are, they were counted as part of Abia in the census. You collect revenue, bec uh, more revenue because of them. But then, no, you can't walk in there. You are not an indigent. So while we are pointing one finger there, ladies and gentlemen, look closely. The other three are saying, let's get it here. And so how can this new leadership emerge? With very, and then, of course, the entry fee is very high. The fourth the new Biafranism, and that is my last point. And let me say that Nigeria has wittingly or unwittingly dragged the Biafran issue from the periphery into the mainstream discussion. Nam De Kano, in my view, threw a bet, and Nigeria took it. Today, he is the most popular political prisoner and will end up either as a hero or a martyr. But to his credit, he has forced Nigeria and the world to discuss Biafra. I believe that keeping him there does not do Nigeria any good. I believe this young man should be released and released like yesterday. I will not be surprised if he becomes a subject of the next political campaigns. Just like who dealt with Awolowo, who was convicted and imprisoned of treason, or Gawan, <laughs> charged with treason, or even Ojuku himself, who was forgiven, and so on and so forth, <laughs> I don't want to make any predictions, but I believe we need to solve this. Because according to Ofodile, this book, quote, he said, the lesson to be learned, if anyone cares to listen, is that the detention of Nam De Kano, no matter for how long, will not stop the agitation of Biafra, end of quote. He further argues that the detention of Uwazurike between 2005 to 2007 helped to radicalize his followers. The same thing happened when the leader of Boko Haram was killed his followers became more radicalized. Detention of Nam De Kano, I never heard of him before this time, to be quite honest. Never heard of him. I didn't even know about the IPOB uh, or whatever thing. Until this thing, and you now realize globally it's become an issue and it's become mainstream. Now, and again, quote, he says, this book argues, that the idea of a customary government under the Supreme Council of Elders in accordance with customary law enjoys the support among a section of the Igbo, but it is the Biafra or death philosophy of Nam De Kano that found resonance across the length and breadth of the Igbo nation. Therefore, there cannot be a resolution of the Biafran dilemma without a wholesome engagement of the Nam De Kano stroke Uche Mefo faction of IPOB. End of quote. That's what this was. So, if I were President Buhari, quite honestly, I would be very suspicious of anyone who advises me to ignore the Biafran issue. I'd be very suspicious. Anybody who says that is either ignorant or being mischievous or quite patently doesn't mean well for the government itself. It probably wants the same government to repeat the mistakes of the past so that it could lead it down the train. We must start learning in this country. So let's talk Biafra. Where are the Igbo elite 
and the intelligentsia in all of this, especially those in Nigeria. It seems, as this book points out, this is being driven mostly by the Igbo intelligentsia in diaspora, the new resurgence. The new ones within, there seems to be a division, three classes you can identify. The ones within the mainland, and I'm shocked, and you discuss, they have a different point of view. Those in diaspora within Nigeria, so to speak, who are in Abuja and Lagos and so on and so forth, Kano, Kaduna, and so on. And an elder was asked about that, living in one of these uh, northern states about Biafra, and they asked him, uh, what do you think about this Biafra? He said, well, no. I just said, no, I came my name and I'm a man now when I was in no, I'm not a In other words, they should keep it up, but you know I can no longer go now. You see, all the things I have here, I cannot carry them on my head. So, there seems to be a sense of either denial and on one part, or people who think, no, 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 it won't be, because we can't just imagine it. And because of some discussion that, oh, okay, if this happens, uh, you will lose your property, you will lose that, and so on. Of course, that is untenable. I mean, uh, I, I too was wrong on this, because if, uh, if by any chance you have another state of Biafra, it will be the 16th state of ECOWAS. And that means you have free movement of goods and persons. But the fundamental question, the fundamental issue is that this debate is not happening. This whole thing is being driven almost in a haphazard manner. Last week, they called for, was that last week? Yeah, last week. They called for a seat, seat at home. And even without anybody getting out to more in force and so on, I learned virtually Anambra and many other cities were completely shut down. It just tells you there is something going on. But, again, where is the elite in this? What is missing is structural debate and the apparent elite aloofness or complicity or hypocrisy. The elite in denial. For the politicians who think you can just, let's use them temporarily, you know, let's use them. No, um, just go on. Why we can then use that to negotiate uh, for something here. I can tell you, <laughs> you will create a monster that will consume you. <laughs> when that fame inferno comes, both us, everybody else, and the kind of thing that happened in Biafra where decent, any decent was considered a saboteur. Okay? You might get to a point where you will be telling them, just go on, while we can negotiate here, get something for ourselves in Abuja. I can tell you these guys are no fools. At some point, they will look at you too and know that you are actually part of the problem. <laughs> and so on and so forth. So, I say, let the debate, the debate must begin. The late Dr. Payoso Kibo, in this book as well, presented what the memo by late Dr. Payoso Kibo presented to the Biafran government on the economic viability of Biafra. Nobody is talking about what the, new, what the currency will look like. How will you fare with international trade? What kind of constitution are you talking about? And Afodile forcefully argues here that the Ahera Declaration of 1969 came too late. They, they had intelligentsia pushing for Biafra, but there was no organized structure. That if they had done what they did towards the end of the war, at the beginning, a, a Biafra would not have been ended the way that it did. But what is shocking is people talk about this in their bedrooms and in their parlors, and then you come out and everybody is just, mm, and so on. I'm sure it will not take long. So what I am calling is that we must, the elite, the intelligentsia, get out of the closet and let us, now that the issue, the president in New York made a point. He said there will be no referendum in Biafra. Now, and I said, my reaction to it was, oh my God, 
So this matter has actually gotten to the point where we are now talking whether to have a referendum or not to have a referendum. The moment you've reached that point, it tells you that it's only a matter of uh, time. But who is driving the debate? The New Zikism, New Biafranism, and so on and so forth, everybody seems to be quite quiet. And finally, let me agree with Walesho Inka that Biafra is an idea. And that is what this book talks about. You can't defeat it with guns or prison cells. The only way to defeat it is to offer a counter-narrative. What should? There has been none, no counter-narrative until now. What Honorable Afodile has done is to provide very powerful, not only counter-narrative, but counter-narratives. And I will say, and stresses the urgency of action now. The clock is ticking. And I can only end by congratulating Chode for this eminent work. Thank you very much.